And welcome to the Aaron Katzman Show. I'm your host, Aaron Katzman. We're here to speak to you about your life, your money, and your investments. And as always, we're coming to you from the spiritual and soon to be financial capital of the world, Jerusalem, Israel. If you've got any questions or comments, feel free to email me at Aaron, A A R O N, at lighthouse with an L, lighthousecapital.co.il. That's Aaron at lighthousecapital.co.il. You can check me out on the web at www.aaronkatzman.com. That's www.aaronkatzman.com. You can find me on Twitter and be sure to subscribe to our brand new YouTube channel at Aaron Katzman. Well, it's my honor to introduce to all of you Andrew Tritel, who is a veteran attorney with more than 20 years experience specializing now in inheritance, trusts and estates and elder law. He's admitted to the bar in New York and in Israel, and having lived and worked in both the U.S. and Israel, Andrew is familiar with the cultural and business norms in Israel and abroad, and that's really important because there are big cultural differences. Um, he's got many years of corporate law and general counsel experience. He, bring, he brings a broad view of individual clients' needs and enables the client to consider other elements of the matter being handled. Andrew, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to be here. First of all, I want to, before we get into it, I'm curious because I gave that little preamble um, and you spoke about cultural differences between the U.S. and Israel. Uh, this was not planned, <laughs> but what do you mean by that exactly? Um, well, I think the most famous cultural difference in the business context is that in America, when you finish a meeting and you seem to have summed up everything at the meeting in America, the assumption is the item is done, you've closed the matter, and now you're moving forward. Where in Israel, it's often, okay, that's an interim conclusion, and now we can still re renegotiate and open up the matter again. Okay, okay, good. Well, that means we can, once we finish the show, we can bring you back. Because <laughs> <laughs> we're based in Israel. <laughs> okay. Um, I'd like to start off, you're an expert in um, Israeli enduring powers of attorney. Okay, that's something that's become sort of hot and relevant over the last couple of years. Um, first of all, not everybody can do that, correct? You have to have like a special license uh, in order to do that. We'll get into that. But can you also explain to us what that is? Sure. So in, well, in Israel, we call an enduring power of attorney is what in America, is usually called the springing power of attorney. And I will explain that. Um, in America, there's two types of powers of attorney. One's a durable power of attorney and one is a springing power of attorney. A durable power of attorney is a power of attorney that goes into effect the day that it's signed. In other words, signed power of attorney, I give you, Aaron, uh, the power to act on my behalf and then have power to act on my behalf. That in America is a durable power of attorney. A springing power of attorney in America is that I sign a power of attorney, but it will only go into effect when I am no longer competent and able to make decisions on my own. So even though I sign it today in November, 2020, it might not go into effect for another 10, 15 or 20 years. That's the situation in America. In Israel, there is a concept of a durable power of attorney, which is you sign the power of attorney today, it goes into effect today. However, under Israeli law, when you become incompetent, it no longer is effective. So basically it's worthless. It's worthless, right? <laughs> because it's worthless, because most people want a durable power of attorney specifically for those situations when they are no longer competent. So that's where the enduring power of attorney, the Israeli Yipui Koach Mitmashech, comes into the picture. A person has to consign a power of attorney, and it will only go into effect when they are no longer competent. Now, the idea of the government's idea when they enacted this legislation was to give the person the most control over their decision making. In other words, um, you even have the right to decide who determines that you are incompetent. In other words, I can say, let's say I'm giving the power of attorney to my wife. I can say that the determination that I am no longer competent can be made by a doctor. I can name a specific doctor. I could say it needs to be done by a doctor 
in coordination with my sister. I could say it could be my best friend. I could say it could be three doctors. In other words, for people that are afraid that the power of attorney will go into effect before they're really incompetent, you can choose who makes that determination. So on the one hand, it gives you a lot of leeway and a lot of discretion. On the other hand, it sometimes gets complicated for people because they don't really know what to decide. If you don't decide anything, the default right now under the law is any doctor. So some will take you to a doctor. The doctor writes a letter basically saying this person can no longer make decisions. And then the power of attorney goes into effect. Okay, okay. so, the so let's say, so let's just clarify for a second. Let's say I have uh, an elderly parent Okay, who's who's becoming uh, whatever p- potential dementia issues, or just getting older, and you're you're worried at some point that there's going to be a, a certain incompetence uh, coming up, and will not be able to make rational decisions for yourself. You would want to then for themselves. You would then want to create one of these uh, enduring powers of attorney. Correct. Correct. And they, and they, do they obviously are they need both to- on. Sorry to interrupt. It, it, it relates to both medical and financial matters or just medical matters? How does that work? Okay, terrific question. And that's what I want to discuss next. The enduring power of attorney covers three matters, financial matters, medical matters, and what's called personal matters. Okay, financial matters is pretty straightforward. Uh, medical matters, is basically anything that requires a doctor. However, it does not include end of life decisions, which I'll get back to in a minute. The third item is persons, and those are matters that don't necessarily require a financial institution and don't require a doctor. So um, it could be, let's, different types of treatment or physical therapy or, signing you up for courses in an old age home, that could be under the personal matter. Uh So the Israeli enduring power of attorney covers three items, financial, medical, and personal. And now I mentioned end of life decisions. In Israel, there's a separate law that applies to end of life decisions, what in America people call DNR, do not resuscitate. The law says that if you are in a situation where you have an incurable disease and you have less than six months to live, as the doctors determine, then someone can, you can give a power of attorney. Um, in America, it's called the healthcare proxy. Okay. Obviously, you don't wait until the six months to do it. You can do it way in advance, but it only applies to situations when you have six months to live and an incurable disease. So that's a separate document that you actually don't need a lawyer. There's standard forms from the Ministry of Health. You can download them. I can send them to you, but you can download them and you just submit them to the Ministry of Health. On the enduring power of attorney, when I said it covers medical matters, there it covers all medical matters that are not related to the end of life. So for example, if someone has dementia, but they need hip surgery, um, so someone needs to sign the documents at the, at the doctor's office or the hospital, all other medical treatments, eye treatments, um, all things like that are covered by the enduring power of attorney. Okay. Now, the way the enduring power of attorney is built, as opposed to a traditional American power of attorney where you just appoint one person, the Israeli power of attorney, by its design, allows you to appoint a different person for the financial, for the medical, and for the personal. So in if your example, if someone's parents are leaning towards dementia and they say, you know, one of my children is a doctor. I want that child making the medical decisions. Another child uh, is a a protege of Aaron Katzman. So I think that he should make the financial decisions. And another child is is a social worker and they should be making the personal decisions. Uh You have the right to do that. You could appoint different people for each different uh, item. You could always appoint the same one for all three. You can also appoint more than one. In other words, you can say, for each of those decisions, I want it to be both of my children. I have clients that said, I want all four children involved in a decision. And then we have to then say, okay, but what happens if it's a two-two tie? So you have, on the one hand, you have a lot of leeway to put a lot of verbiage and language into the document. 
Sometimes it scares people and they want to make it as simple as possible. Other people have thought about it and really want to give detailed instructions. In addition, you also have the right to give specific instructions. For example, many of my clients say, as long as that I have the financial means, I would like to be kept at home with home care, not sent to an old age home. I have another client that says, every new year I send each grandchild $100. If I'm no longer competent, I want you to continue doing that. I have clients who say, I always give to this charity every year. Even if I'm no longer competent, please continue doing that. So you have a lot of leeway to, uh, to put the instructions that you want, or you could leave it, so to speak, blank and basically trust that the person you're appointing knows what your wishes are. Okay. Yeah. One other oh. thing, <laughs> sorry, is that it also has built in that you can appoint a backup. So let's say you're appointing your son, who's the expert in financial matters, but if for some reason he's not available, you can already say who you want the backup person to him to be. Oh, that's interesting. So let me ask you a question, because I think that the um, thought is, well, I'll wait for my parents, for example, to get elderly, and then we'll, we'll try and do it. But is, should this, I, I, I know a few people who, who, who've done things a little bit differently. I would assume that like, if you're doing a will and doing other estate planning things, you should take care of this when you're much, when you're much younger. Is that, would you sort of say that's good advice? I definitely think it's good advice that when someone is considering their general estate, they should be, they should have a will and they should do this in Israel an enduring power of attorney. And they should also do the, the healthcare documents that I mentioned, the end of life healthcare. First of all, it's much easier to do when you have your faculties all together, but also when you're not so concerned and you're nervous about your immediate situation. In other words, if you see that dementia is on the horizon, it might be harder to make decisions when if you can do it 10 or 15 years earlier, it's easier. On the other hand, sometimes when people are younger, they just want to do them, which is fine. They want to do the most basic uh, power of attorney. They don't want to get involved with um, too many details and too many instructions because they haven't really thought about it, but that's fine. You can always change it later on. Okay. Just one thing that many clients ask me is what happens if they don't have a power of attorney? What happens then? So if, let's say, one of our parents um, loses their mental capacity and can no longer make decisions on their own, then a guardian has to be appointed by the court. And there's two problems with that. One, that means taking the parent to the court and it's a, it's a court process. It's not fun. It's a little demeaning to have a judge look at you and then, or have evidence from the uh, social services, and then to have an, an official declaration that you are no longer competent. That's the meaning of the person. And it's, a not, it's not a pleasant process for anyone. The point of the enduring power of attorney is that it's basically all done in the comfort of your home, your attorney's office, and you never see the inside of a court. In addition, when you're appointed a court you're a court appointed guardian for someone. There's limitations on the things that you can do. There's limitations on how you can invest, on what decisions you can make. You often have to go back to the court to get approval to do certain things. So it's also a headache on the person who's taking care of you. Whereas if you have a, a power of attorney, there's none of those limitations. Only in very specific situations do you have to go to a court. Um, just okay. to say, for an example, you can't sell real estate on behalf of the person who appointed you without court approval. Um, that's the most famous one. Okay. And certain transactions over a certain amount of money will also need a court approval. But in general, under this scenario, no one ever has to go to court and the family member, whoever is appointed, uh, has much more leeway and much more freedom and much more comfort taking on the role as the agent appointed. Okay. Um, Andrew, I was remiss. How can people get a hold of you? Um, well, either by email at Andrew at Tritel Law, which is T R E I T E L Law.com, or by my website, Tritel Law.com, or by calling me in the office at 03 629 4601. Okay. Which I guess I should. Today is currently the financial capital, but I understand that Jerusalem is going to yeah. soon become the financial capital yeah. of the world. You don't want to go there. We are coming up to be the financial capital of the world. Let me tell you about that. Uh, it is the Aaron Katzman Show. I'm your host, Aaron Katzman. We're speaking to you about your life, your money, and your investments. If you've got any questions or comments, feel free to email me at Aaron, A-A-R-O-N, at Lighthouse with an L, lighthousecapital.co.il. 
That's Aaron at lighthousecapital.co.il. You can check me on the web at www.aaronkatzman.com. That's www.aaronkatzman.com. You can find me on Twitter and be sure to subscribe to our brand new YouTube channel at Aaron Katzman. We're speaking with Andrew Tritel, who is a, who's a lawyer who specializes in inheritance, trusts, and estates and elder law. We just had a really, really thorough run through of the Israeli enduring power of attorney, which was great. I'd like to transition for the last couple of minutes um, and speak about trusts. Um, oftentimes, clients call me and they say, Aaron, we've heard that we need a trust. So I always uh, say, well, why? That's always my first question, why? And I go, well, I heard from a friend that it's a good thing to have a trust. So that's not a particularly persuasive answer for me. But you're the expert. Can you give us a little bit of a rundown? First of all, what is a trust? And then we'll get into why people might want to create one. Okay, so a trust is actually, it's it's not a, a, it's, a phys, it's a legal relationship between the grantor or the person who sets up the trust and the trustee, the person who you trust who manages the uh, the assets, so it's a it's a legal relationship, one based on trust, um, and probably the reason why most people think that they should have a trust is because in America, particularly, the value of a trust is that when you pass away, you're you don't have to go through the probate process. So let me just take a step back. If you don't have a trust and you pass away and you have assets in America. If you have a will, the will has to be submitted to the court, which is called the probate process. The court reviews the will, approves it, and then appoints an executor who then collects your assets from the various institutions and make sure they get transfers to the heirs that were listed in your will. That's called probate. If you die without a will, the court, the court will appoint an administrator and then the assets will get transferred to whoever the heirs are by law if you don't have a will. And each state in America has slightly different rules about that. So the probate process, especially for my clients that live in Israel, they don't want to have to deal with that process in America because it means hiring a lawyer. It means paying court fees. It means that the documents and your information becomes part of the public record. Someone who wants to go look up your, your records can file to the court and get a copy of the document. It takes time and it's a headache. So many people in America set up a trust. So again, a trust is a relationship. So if you have what's called a revocable trust, or sometimes it's called the living trust, it's a trust that can be changed over time. It's an, in a living trust, and what people usually do in America, you can actually be the trustee of your own trust. In other words, I, Andrew, entrust my assets to Andrew Tritel to, to look after my assets. And what does that mean? Uh, sorry, and then after, I pass away, there's a successor trustee, whoever I appoint. So, and the trust says what the trustee should do with the assets while I'm alive. So if it's my trust, it usually would say any assets in the trust should be used for the benefit of Andrew, Andrew's spouse, Andrew's family. And then it says when Andrew passes away, the successor trustee, and usually it will say, can then distribute the assets to Andrew's spouse or to Andrew's children. And often what people say is, um, it should be transferred to the children, but only when they reach a certain age. So if God bid, I should pass away and let say my wife passes away before um, my children reach the age of 18, I wouldn't want them to necessarily get all the assets at 18 and then spend it right away. So in the trust, I would say maybe they should only get a certain amount when they're 20, 25, 30, 35. Okay. Um, so Basically, what I just said was there's two main reasons for having a trust. One is to avoid probate, and two is to set is to spread out the distributions over time. Now, let me just explain why it avoids probate. And even though I said it's not a legal construct, it's very similar to a corporation. If I own shares in a corporation, I pass away, the corp the corporation's bank account still exists. So even though I passed away, um, from, from the bank's point of view, nothing has changed except maybe the signature rights of the corporation. So here too, if I have a trust um, 
and then I pass away, all that needs to change is that we notify the bank and say, Andrew is no longer the trustee of the trust. It now is somebody else, but everything else continues. So there's no paperwork that really needs to be done other than one piece of paper. Um, nothing needs to go through the court and everything just continues. The accounts all continue as if I were still alive. Um, just one thing I guess I, I skipped and I didn't say is when you set up a trust, what you need to do is you need to say, my account that right now is in the name of Andrew Tritel, I'm transferring those assets from my account to a new account. And the name of the new account is the Andrew Tritel Trust. So that for tax purposes, that's not a taxable event. So even though the account has changed names and changed account numbers, that's not considered a transaction for tax purposes. And every financial institution is very familiar with this. It doesn't create any extra paperwork. It's very simple and very easy to do. Okay. So how does that relate, let's say, in Israel? You mentioned how it works okay. in, in America. So let's get to Israel. Okay. So in Israel, if you're an Israeli and only have assets in Israel, there's not much need for the type of trust that I said, a revocable trust. Um, if you're an Israeli living in Israel, but you do have assets in the States, like many only in many people who move to Israel and many people who use the fine services of Aaron Katzman, then you do have assets in the States. And uh, then it does make sense to avoid probate to uh, set up a trust. Now, I don't know if time permits, the other type of trust that some people have is what's called an irrevocable trust. That is a trust that you can't change over time. And the main reason why people, there's two reasons why people have those type of trusts. One is for estate tax planning, um, that US citizens are subject to estate tax and Israeli citizens that have US assets above $60,000. I don't wanna go into the, all the details now, but one way to, to minimize the total estate tax that you would have to pay when you pass away is by transferring assets while you're alive into an irrevocable trust. Um, of course, now there was just an election in the States and one of the, one of the issues that they're discussing is will the exemption limit for estate taxes be reduced from 11.5 million back down to 5 million or 3 million? Nobody knows. A lot of it has to do with what happens in the Georgia elections, if the Senate has Republican control or not. But that's an issue to keep, to be aware of in the coming year is a uh, estate tax in the US. The other reason why to set up a, an irrevocable trust is what's called asset protection. It's a way of taking assets that are mine and putting them in a structure that is no longer, legally it's no longer mine. It's held by the trust and by the trustee. So if someone sues me personally, let's say I'm a lawyer, um, and if they, even though I have a legal, I have a, a firm and a company under Israeli law, I could still be sued personally. So if I want to protect my assets, so if somebody sues me, or if I'm a doctor and I get sued for malpractice, I want to make sure that there's money on the side, that even if I get sued for everything I own and I lose and I have to give up all my money, I've already set aside money in a separate irrevocable trust for asset protection purposes. So those are the two reasons that people have irrevocable trusts. Great. Andrew, once again, how can people get a hold of you? Uh, you can call me in my office at 03-629-4601. If you're calling from the States, you can call 917-724-2150, which forwards to me in Israel. You can email me at andrew at tritel-law.com. That's T-R-E-I-T-E-L-law.com. And my website, tritel-law.com. Thanks so much for, for joining us. And I hope we can, uh, like we said, we'll, we'll pick up the conversation uh, another time we'll speak again. With pleasure. Thanks Thank so you much. This is the Aaron Katzman Show. I'm your host, Aaron Katzman. We speak to you about your life, your money, and your investments. You got any questions or comments? Feel free to email me at Aaron at lighthousecapital.co.il. You can check me out on the web at www.aaronkatzman.com. You can follow me on Twitter and be sure to subscribe to our brand new YouTube channel where you get all of our interviews and all of our content directly into your inbox. Take care and we'll speak to you soon.